Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Mesa City Council meeting for uh, Thursday morning, September the 19th. Uh, I believe we have Mr. Freeman participating on the telephone. Is that right, Mr. Freeman? Yep, I'm here. Good morning. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to review the items on the September 23rd regular council meeting agenda. So, council, if you could please refer to that document. Um, I know there are, that uh, there are at least a few questions. Uh, Mr. Freeman, why don't we just uh, tee up your, your question first off. I know that, that you, you do have a question on the, uh, the Monday agenda. I do, Mayor. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to visit on 6B. Can you hear me okay? Uh, it got a little bit better. We didn't quite catch up. Which item? Uh, 6B. 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 I know yeah, it's that's the, uh, the scooter question. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, uh, we have... Okay. Do, do you want to state your question, or we, we have uh, transportation here ready to make a presentation on it? Can I just listen to that, and then I'll follow up with questions if I have any? Yes. Welcome. Ma Mayor, members of council, good morning. Uh, my name is RJ Zeter with the Transportation Department. With me is Andrew uh, Calhoun. Uh, we've got a brief presentation. We'll, uh, we'll walk through. Please stop us if you have any questions. Obviously, you've seen a lot of this information before. Uh, as of the last uh, count, uh, we have about 600 scooters uh, in the city right now. It's, it, it's actually dropped quite a bit uh, from the peak, you know, when the, the, the scooters uh, and the bikes first came uh, into uh, the city. Uh, there are currently four operators uh, uh, working uh, in, in Mesa. Jump left at the uh, end of April. Uh, we'll see if they come back when the weather uh, turns nice. If you recall, Jump had both scooters and uh, e-bikes. Uh, our neighboring cities, we don't have a count, or actually have uh, substantially more, Tempe uh, and Scottsdale uh, in particular. Uh, we worked with the industry to get feedback. Um, by and large, the feedback has been very positive. Uh, one of the operators still has some concern about the indemnification uh, uh, liability language uh, in, the, um, in the proposed terms and conditions that would come later uh, to council. Um, but overall, the uh, feedback has been very positive. What, what we're, we've got two things that are actually three items that are going to be coming before council. Uh, what we're discussing this morning is actually an ordinance uh, that modifies the city code that really sets up the framework uh, for what we call shared active transportation vehicles. Uh, subsequent to uh, uh, the introduction of the ordinance, we will be bringing forward, uh, depending on, on council direction, two resolutions. Uh, the first resolution will actually establish uh, the terms and conditions under which the uh, SATV operators uh, can stage their vehicles in the public right-of-way, and then a separate resolution which would establish the license fee. Uh, one of the things we work through uh, is should we have a limited area for uh, staging of the, the scooters and bikes, uh, we are recommending that we allow the industry and let the, kind of the market determine uh, where the, the, these vehicles should be placed, so we would be recommending citywide um, operation. So we are proposing to reduce the impound fee if we have to retrieve an improperly placed scooter or bike from $100 to $50. The reason we're proposing this is some of our neighbors have actually had a problem with the companies coming back to get um, the scooters. In other words, if the fee is at $100, uh, depending on how old the scooter is, they're just le they're just not coming and getting them, and that's not our goal. Uh, we're not looking to have a collection uh, of scooters uh, and or bikes. More uh, just to um, recover our cost uh, to to pick those up. Since we're proposing looking at this as a pilot program, uh, we're proposing a $100 uh, license fee. This will give us the opportunity over the next year to truly evaluate what costs there are. Uh, today, uh, as, as, as we speak, we're spending really no time uh, managing uh, this program. We haven't had any complaints recently uh, and had any significant problems. Thank you, RJ. Mr. Luna. RJ, uh, what is this license fee in our surrounding communities? Are they comparable or 
Uh, the, our neighbors do have substantially higher uh, fees. Uh, you can see Phoenix and Tempe uh, at, for an example, uh, although Scottsdale has no fee uh, because they don't require uh, a, a license. Uh, they have penalty fees that you can see in the lower right uh, corner of the, this particular slide, uh, but they don't charge a license fee at all since they don't require one. Uh, Phoenix and Tempe, as I mentioned, uh, have uh, a, many more scooters than what we're seeing here in Mesa. So the, 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 the theory is that the pilot period uh, would give us an opportunity to determine what costs we're actually incurring. So we proposed $100 simply to cover the processing cost of the actual license application. It's a pretty straightforward application. It's the name of the company, it's, you know, it's, it's insurance, it, it's, really, it's really pretty basic requirements. So there, it, there's not a, a significant amount of work uh, that would go into uh, actually processing the application itself. We talked about the indemnification language. Uh, the city attorney's office did agree to modify the language slightly based on conversation with the industry. Uh, again, uh, we modified the, the staging requirements and we're also proposing to reduce the helmet requirement to 100 per year that each operator would have to donate uh, to the city that we would use as part of bike and scooter safety uh, programs. So timeline, uh, again, uh, depending on council direction, uh, we would look to uh, adopt uh, the ordinance in October. Uh, depending on where council would prefer to be on fees, uh, we would bring resolutions forward for the uh, fees and terms and conditions. And uh, a year from November, we would come back to council with a overview of how the year has gone and whether we propose any changes to the program. So, Mayor Council, are you just maybe explain this because I'm not sure um, all members of council aware of this. So, when we establish fees by state law, we have to give notice uh, to, before we can actually impl implement that. We've we've given notice of the fees that are being proposed today, correct? Correct. However, and if council so chooses to modify those, that would be fine. It would just we'd have to make the effective date. Um, six days from the time we'd give that notice, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Brady. Uh, Mayor and Council, there is a statutory requirement that proposed fees be advertised 60 days prior to adoption, which we have done with the $100 proposed fee. Should Council choose to uh, elect a different fee? Not a problem, we just have to re-notice uh, whatever that fee is and uh, we would bring the terms and conditions uh, and the fee resolution 60 days prior, um, following posting of the new fee. <clears throat> so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Luna, are most of the bikes, uh, the scooters located in the central corridor of the community or are they scattered throughout the city of Mesa? What are you finding in your uh, research? We see them both in the downtown area, but we're also seeing them in the Fiesta District uh, in, in, in particular near MCC. You see them uh, around transit lines. Every now and then you're surprised, you know, but you'll see an odd one, you know, pretty far away. I don't know if it's someone that rode it there or put it on a bus, you know, and took it there. But I would say the preponderance of scooters are in the downtown and West Mesa area. Thank you. I, I know, Mr. Freeman, uh, you, you're concerned about this yes. issue. Do you, you want to address your questions now? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, private ownership of the SATVs. I had some people in my district have their own. Are they going to be affected by any of the application fees or licensing? Mayor, or Vice Mayor. Sorry. Mayor, Vice Mayor, no. The, the, we are only dealing with um, the license will only affect companies who are staging scooters and bikes for rent within the public right of way. So if you are an owner of your own scooter or e-bike, the license would not apply. However, there are some conditions in the ordinance that do affect users of, of scooters uh, in terms of maximum, is, is the maximum speed limit in the, in the ordinance. So there are some speed limits tied to the scooters that would affect all operators, but the license itself would only apply to basically for-profit companies. Okay. Uh, another question is, I couldn't find any ordinance about scooters riding on sidewalks. Is that permissible? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, we are proposing that scooters are authorized uh, to be operated on sidewalks unless there is signage um, restricting their usage, and that would be on Main Street in the downtown where scooters would not be allowed. Okay, there was a poll that I saw that 64% of the people who were 
preferred no scooters on sidewalks. So I just wanted to uh, pass that along. Um, my, my last question is on the application fee. And I know, RJ, you and I have had this conversation with Mr. Smith about it. But I, I think it's pretty low. And the reason being is even though this is a pilot program, uh, we've invested a lot of staff time into the preparation of this ordinance. And not only our attorney and transportation, but I, I would I would propose that we have a higher application fee. And that's just me because uh, you say there's going to be possibly four applicants, and with that, that would be a four hundred dollars if each applicant choose to uh, get into the program. That's only four hundred dollars annually. And I, I don't think that's the uh, that time and everything in preparation for that is a reasonable uh, fee. So that's my comment, and I would defer to my colleagues on how they feel on that. Thank you. <clears throat> Jen. Um, I'd like to also comment on the application fee. I think it's very low, especially considering um, looking at the impound fee, and I understand wanting to lower it so you don't accumulate the rental vehicle. But if we can increase our application fee to try to offset some of those costs that we're going to incur, because I'm sure it's going to cost us more than $50 um, in staff time and overhead to collect them, um, notify, you know, on process to pick up a scooter, um, I would just like to see the application um, fee increased in order to compensate for some of the um, other the administrative costs we're going to uh, incur in managing this, um, this the SATVs. Um, I have some other questions as well. I don't know if it's, if, Mark, did you want to, I don't want to um, get started on my whole long list of questions without um, allowing you to conclude your thoughts. I, I think he, I think okay. we're good. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, I'm glad we're not going to have. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd also like to advocate that we also look at, you know, our dedicated bike lanes and make, having those transit, because uh, scooters need to be in the bike paths and off sidewalks. And when looking at our streets, that so we make sure that we have those dedicated bike paths that are, are safe and, and, um, accessible and makes sense in our transit, I think will help with the controversy around the scooters and whether they're um, safe or not and get them off the sidewalks. So some of those questions related to that are, we're not putting any restrictions on the how many miles per hour or geofencing. Um, uh, Mayor, um, Councilmember Duff, we are putting in a limit. Uh, the scooters cannot exceed 15 miles per hour. Okay and the electronic bikes cannot exceed 20 miles per hour. Okay. We are not proposing geofencing uh, at this time. There is a prohibition on staging the uh, scooters in parks, uh, for example, um, but that's something we've communicated to the companies and I don't believe it's been a problem recently. Okay. Um, so when we look at our quantities, the daily, these are limits here? Or these are just estimates? This is the last number we got from each of the companies as to how many uh, scooters they have in Mesa right now. Oh, okay. All right. And do you know where those concentrations? That's just citywide? This is for the whole city. Uh, again, you know, where you see them more is in this area, you know, in, in your district, as well as in, in West Mesa. So but are we 600 across the whole city really is, is it's, it's small. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the numbers are in the thousands in some of our neighboring cities. Are we limiting the no. number at all? Okay. Assuming letting allowing the market to it, and we're going to reevaluate where we are after allowing just. Some, yes. I mean, we're in the summertime; it's not a problem now in the downtown area, but as we get to winter, I don't know if it'll level off from where it was before it was overwhelming. So we'll see. Uh, Mayor, um, council member, it, it's hard to say what the what nice weather is you know going to bring. I I don't personally think we're going to see the same number of scooters. I don't know that the market can support the, the number that came in initially. I think the companies were trying to get their their brand seen, uh, you know, in the city. Uh, we'll find out, uh, obviously, when, when the cooler temperatures come, but that's something we will keep a close eye on. Okay. And then um, the helmets, how does a rider 
get a helmet? Well, that's something we would do some public outreach on that they could contact our, our, our staff. We have a bike ped group. Uh, Garrett is our new bike ped coordinator who's here in the audience. Uh, we do training in schools. We're very active in getting out in, uh, publicly uh, in doing uh, bicycle training. Um, one of the operators, I'd have to check to see if they still do it, had a program where if you paid the shipping fee, they would send you a helmet. So there's, there's different ways we can communicate uh, to folks how they can uh, obtain a helmet. Okay, so it's not left upon the operators to provide it. We will just within our system. We're requiring that they would, each operator would give us 100 helmets, okay. and then we would determine how to dis distribute, distribute them. Distribute them. Okay, and but it's not required for the rider to have a helmet. If, is it under 18? Mm -hmm. Just the same, I guess, as for bikes, right? right? Because in bikes, we don't require it, so. Yeah, correct. We, um, helmets are required for riders under 18 only for motorized skateboards, which are slightly different um, than an SATV defined, but other than that, they're just highly encouraged. And there are age restrictions on renting a scooter, right? 18 years old. 18 years old. Again, from an enforcement standpoint, you know, what we've seen, that's a challenge. Uh, you know, if, 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 if a parent gives their child a, a, a credit card or, or a debit card, you know, which is really all you need to sign up, but the requirements would say that you have to be 18 to yeah, rent a I scooter. I think we need to put a lot more pressure on the operators in order to enforce that, as well as the number of people on a scooter. And there is requirement in the ordinance yeah. that restricts the number to one user per scooter, okay. because we, I have seen myself where you have multiple people on. Yeah. I've seen two, someone told me they saw someone with three. I'm not sure how you pulled that off, but. Okay, well thank you, and I'm sure, sure we're um, accommodating for the scooters in our plans and the Mesa moves and how we look at it. Yes, you know, one of the, our city differently. back to the fee, and certainly it's, it's, it's certainly council's discretion to establish what it thinks is an appropriate fee. One of the things we don't want to do is, because this is something that is used, you know, we don't want the fee to be so high um, that we're discouraging um, the companies from operating in, in Mesa. Um, yeah, um, compared to other cities, I think we still have room to move on mm -hmm. doing a higher application mm -hmm. fee given the <coughs> administrative costs that we incur in managing the system, so. Why not? Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Francisco. The uh, <clears throat> on the license fee, reducing it from five thousand to one hundred. <clears throat> what's the reasoning behind that? So we didn't, large. We didn't reduce it. That's just the rent. Or, or just we yeah, had some. Yes, we had we had some prior conversations about a five thousand dollar fee. What we found again is that the amount of time we thought we were going to spend in this program is significantly less. To be fair, we have spent a fair amount of time, as the vice mayor points out, developing, you know, or getting uh, to where we're at today. But in terms of day-to-day -day, uh, costs, we haven't really incurred any. And that's why we we're gonna look at the next year, you know, again, as the nice weather comes back, if we see more, more scooters, if the bikes come back, and we can really keep better track of how much staff time is involved in managing the program. Okay. And then did you say uh, we're not prohibiting all sidewalks, just in certain areas like downtown? Because I feel, uh, I, I agree where there's high density uh, walk, uh, pedestrians walking on sidewalks, we might have to, we, uh, you know, eliminate that. But in some of the areas, I've seen them in my district and where, you know, on the roads, people are driving really fast and to, to do on the, and there's no bike lanes in, in some of these roads. And so allowing them in sidewalks there makes sense just for safety reasons. And so you said there's, there's no prohibition on all sidewalks, just in certain areas, right? Mayor, uh, Councilmember, let me clarify. Uh, we would prohibit e-bikes uh, that are not in town right now, but that were in town. They would not be able to operate on the sidewalks because of the higher speed that they can operate on. The scooters would be allowed uh, on sidewalks with the exception of, of, of downtown. Okay. And different cities have approached this different ways. Mm -hmm. Some have prohibitions on riding on sidewalks. Uh, our thought process, and, and, and it's just staff conversation, is, is, is what you pointed to, is that in parts of the city where you have 45 mile an hour uh, speed limits, uh, even with bike lanes, uh, you know, with scooters operating at 15 miles an hour, you know, we thought that the sidewalks actually might be safer uh, sure. for the users uh, in, in, in those cases. And then is there, in the ordinance, is there any guidance to staging locations, or are you all working with the the different uh, 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 operators to define, kind of educate 
on stage locations there? There, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member, there are requirements regarding how the vehicles are staged. You, certainly, you can't block, you know, handicap ramps, you know, ADA ramps for sidewalks, um, bus shelters, you know, uh, entrances, you know, to businesses, that sort of thing. So there are separation requirements, but we're not identifying specific locations where the vehicles have to be staged. No. We're leaving that to the market based on our proposal. That was um, <clears throat> one of my questions too. Is it seems like the whole motivation behind our, the licensure requirement here was was indemnification. So I'm anxious to hear more about that. But the other was staging, and it, it seems like it, if I hear you correctly, rather than saying dictating where they have must stage, we're just pr telling them where they can't stage. That's correct, Mayor. Okay, and, and, and just remember, Mayor and Council is. Um, I think this is the part that's maybe a little challenging for. It took me a while to wrap my head around it. We're allowing this citywide, right? So this idea, when we do that, you know, trying to designate drop-offs through the whole city would be very difficult, and the experience is going to be very diff different. And frankly, part of our challenge is, I think, from a, we're looking for some direction from council, even philosophically, because while we certainly went through an experience early on where we were getting saturated, we think that was unique. I think what we're concerned about in Mesa is. We may not, this may not be a mode of transportation that may be available like it is in other communities around us. And we don't know how that will be received even by those who are coming to downtown or other parts of our community. And so we may have set the bar too low, but we did it more as trying not to be a barrier to encourage anyone to come in. We don't want, um, the economics to be a deterrent from um, these companies to think about Mesa where because Mesa's margins may be a little bit smaller because the volume of activity may be lower. And so frankly, I mean, you could argue that we think this number that you see today should be a lot higher in Mesa. And so we're trying, and I get it why the, the number, the application fee, we could go up. But I would just say if, if the philosophy of council is yes, we want to see this as another mode of transportation in the city, we need to be very careful because in Mesa, I think we're gonna be, for a while, be trying to create, encouraging that. Um, if it's not necessarily a case, and we just really wanna look at this as only as a cost recovery approach and whatever, we can do that. But I, 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 we were just hesitating because we saw our numbers drop off so significantly that it really has not become much of a operations and maintenance we spent more time just drafting the ordinance than we did <coughs> enforcing the activity, so. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, it, when the initial surge occurred, I think we were all, we were, it was horrible. I mean, they were all over the town. They were, uh, and I think we were very afraid that we needed to really get in and heavily regulate this. And, and it's good news, bad news is it's kind of dissipated. The, the bad news is that this is actually a, a good last mile transportation option for folks that are trying to get to uh, transit. And so we, we don't want to see it totally go away. So I, I get the pricing idea that, that we're, we're, uh, we're fairly modest. Uh, I, I, Mr. Freeman's suggestion of $400, I think, would not scare away any company. So I, I think I'm uh, on board with that. Um, so, and I, I, I like the approach on the, uh, the sidewalk issue as well. I think clearly downtown they're inappropriate, it's dangerous. I've seen accidents, but I worry about the safety uh, of not allowing them on sidewalks in other parts of the city. I, I would hesitate to see someone, you know, in, uh, on the asphalt, you know, with one of those. I, for safety reasons, I think the great separation of having them uh, unless they're, if, if we find that they're being used, for example, maybe during spring training session, or spring training season, while we have uh, heavy use of sidewalks competing with scooters, I could see we might want to expand that prohibition to, to the stretch in front of Riverview Park or maybe some other strategic locations. But it sounds like we're going to keep our eye on that and, and come up with good places. So uh, again, I, I think that the point of this is not to generate revenue. So uh, the, 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 the modest license fee seems OK to me. but. Uh, uh, I am, Mr. Smith, interested in hearing a little bit more about the indemnification. It sounds like, are we still, have we settled where we're at on that? Or are, are, are there companies that are saying, no, we're not okay, we're not going to sign this indemnification agreement? Or it sounds like there's been some negotiation going on. Yeah, Mayor and Council. 
Uh, I believe that lasted. There is one company that still has concerns. Whether they'll sign it or not, we'll have to wait and see. You know, in many cases with indemnification, people say that they won't, and then once other people start signing up on the documents, everyone sort of follows suit. The, the actual language actually mirrors, the sort of most critical language mirrors language from an SRP license in which the city of Mesa signs uh, indemnifying SRP. So we're effectively on the other side of the agreement. So we provide that indemnity to SRP. It's a broad form indemnity. And so I'll, I'll say this, the industry has signed a similar, in fact, broader form indemnity in Los Angeles. So we actually, uh, I'd still say I feel comfortable with the indemnity that we've uh, proposed. It is not as broad as the one that a couple, uh, uh, couple companies have signed in Los Angeles. And so that's where we are. Okay. Well, I, I guess my feedback to staff, and I see some heads nodding, uh, is is uh, that we go ahead and up it to $400, and I understand that would delay the implementation by 60 days, but maybe that's, uh, I, I certainly would be in support of that. Other com comments, Mr. F uh, Jeremy? Kevin? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I support... Um, the SATVs, I, I use them, we used them as a family when we were in Oakland to, to uh, get to the game and, and to go back and forth to the Embarcadero area. We use them in D.C. whenever we go um, to visit D.C. So they're, they're, they're a lot of fun. They're dangerous, but you have to know that when you step on the thing and hit the button. Um, it's just like any other, uh, any other mode of transportation out there. There's always going to be risk with... Um, when you get on it, whether it's a, a bicycle or a horse uh, or whatever it may be, um, there's always risk associated with it. And, and knowing that when you get on it, um, you know, it's up to the individual themselves. But I enjoy them. I, I think they're a lot of fun. Um, you know, in D.C., you don't want to ride them in the street, so you ride them on the sidewalk. Um, kind of the same thing in Oakland. Uh, you know, you ride them on the sidewalk because uh, you don't want to be out in the street when people are playing on their cell phones and everything else when they're driving. And so I don't even have really an issue um, with people riding on the sidewalks. What I would have an issue with on the, on the sidewalks is like around the, the uh, MAC um, when there's uh, shows and stuff riding into the MAC area, uh, but on the periphery on the sidewalk, I don't really think it's that big of an issue because um, if it's crowded, more than likely the person's not going to ride on the sidewalk because they don't want to have to try to weave in and out or all of a sudden stop. And, and quite honestly, when you're only going 15 miles an hour, it's super easy to stop the thing and, and jump off of it without, you know, breaking an ankle or something of that nature. So um, I'm supportive. I'd like to see it move forward. Jeremy? just want a quick clarification on that. Um, the permit license, is that a cost per SATV or is that for the entire company to operate on an annual basis. Amazing. It's a single fee to operate. There's not a per vehicle fee in addition. For the company, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and I just want to talk uh, to the point that Frankie had brought up, I believe, on the sidewalks, and I think that the litmus test for that, you know, should be that if we don't feel comfortable putting your child or your grandchild to ride on a street with a scooter, we probably shouldn't impose a law that says they can't ride on the sidewalks in certain areas, right? Um, so I, I echo the concern that, you know, if we force people onto the street, it's going to create a more dangerous um, situation. RJ, I had another question for you. The drop that we've seen, um, do you believe that is uh, simply due to the summertime, or do you, do you anticipate it picking back up when the weather cools off, or do you think that that's a, like, paradigm shift and we won't see as many scooters? Mayor, uh, Council Member Whitaker, I think it's two things. I think it, to some level it's the heat. You know, I think there's a reduction, but I also think it's the market. Um, I, I don't envision, uh, as Mr. Brady said, that come the nice weather that we'll see as many as we saw last year. I just, okay. I, 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 I don't think the economics are going to support as many scooters as we've seen previously. Okay. And um, the other concern I had was the, uh, I think it was the economics uh, situation that Chris had brought up, and I think I believe it's a, it would be the same theory that we use in which we don't charge for parking in downtown Mesa, right? We believe it would uh, drive away and we're trying to attract people to our local businesses. The same concept. Okay, perfect. That's all I have. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> and I don't believe the 400 is egregious, so I don't think it's going to make a difference personally. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I think 400 is, is a great fee. Um, 
I happened to be in Indianapolis this summer. Thank you, Consum Everybody was writing, even old people. Old <laughs> and, they and I thought that was pretty cool. So I think, uh, yeah, I think, you know, if that's, it's a mode of transportation, I think we need to encourage. I think 400 is doable. I think that's something I think we can accept as uh, something that we can move forward. So, um, so I'm supportive. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Mr. Freeman, anything else you'd like to add? I, I do. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, RJ, at the peak of uh, our influx of scooters and e-bikes, how many were in the city, did you estimate? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, probably about 2,500 at peak. And currently we're at how many? 600. Roughly. 600, according to your charting. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to see. I think the, the market's driven down the uh, scooter situation. I know I have a lot of people in my district that enjoy riding them, and I see them at Hoho Cam at the A's game. They'll come to the light rail, and they'll get a scooter, and they'll come north down Center Street. So I, people are exercising that opportunity as well as Riverview. I talked to another family who took the light rail to Dobson and then got on a scooter and came over to Riverview to the Cup Stadium. So I'm all in support of I just, I agree with the $400 at a minimum that do our pilot program and see what we have in a year from now. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mayor Mr. and Council. Smith. What we can do is, is we can leave the ordinance on for Monday. What we can do is create an effective date that's more than 60 days out on the ordinance. And then what we'll do is we'll bring the terms and conditions and the fees uh, separately in 60 days. And so we'll end up matching them all up together more than 60 days out. But that way we can still keep the ordinance on for Monday if you like. Okay. Take okay. care. I see heads nodding. Okay, so we'll just leave it on the consent agenda uh, per uh, the, the uh, path that you suggested. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for working on this thank and you. Uh, resolving it. Uh, the next item on our agenda for this meeting is item 2A. That's to hear a presentation and discuss an update on the 2020 Employee Benefits Program. Ladies, good to have our Employee Benefits folks here. Welcome. We will. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Freeman, Council Members. Uh, I'm Jan Ashley, Employee Benefits Administrator for the City. Jan, and you might need to pull that microphone a little closer. I think we're, thank you. There we go. Is that better? Yes. yes I can tell myself. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Mayor, Council Member, I'm Terry Overby Brown, the Interim HR Director. So this morning I'd like to highlight for the group that's gathered the city's comprehensive and competitive benefit programs that we'll have in place for 2020. Uh, during our open enrollment period, which is coming up very soon, and at our um, annual uh, health and wellness benefits fair, we'll be presenting medical, dental, vision, EAP, uh, life and disability programs and other voluntary benefit programs, including our MESA 360 wellness incentive program to all of our employees and eligible retirees. These programs and services are funded through various sources, including the City's Employee Benefit Trust Fund uh, that has funding generated from City contributions, employee and retiree premiums, state retirement system subsidies and other contracted vendor negotiated uh, subsidies and rebates. Our medical programs include medical, behavioral health and prescription drug benefits. And these will see an increase of approximately 6% to premiums for active employees and approximately 3% of premium increase for retired employees in 2020. That would be in calendar year 2020. The, the factors that contribute to those increases include continuing medical trend increases across the nation, the cost of, of services and drugs are continuing to increase. We've had an increase in membership, we have a modest increase in membership, but that is increasing over time. The number of employees and dependents that are uh, enrolled in our benefit programs is increasing. And we've also had increases in utilization more members are using more of their benefits more of the time equals more claims, equals higher costs that the, the programs are incurring. 
We've also continued to see um, <coughs> continuing usage of out-of-network services on those areas that are high utilisation or frequency type services. So that's an area that we need to take a look at in terms of what we do for our benefit plan options. I have a question on that slide if we can before we move on. Yes. yes. Um, is that six and that three um, percent, will that increase the employees cost or just uh, the uh, city of Mesa cost into the program? It increases both the city and the employees cost. It's shared. Uh, is it shared 50-50, so it will be like a 1.5 and a 3%? No, uh, it, it's a 6% increase on the total premium or a 3% increase on the total premium. And then the city has um, already established a, a funding mechanism that approximately 80% of that core increase is shared by the city and approximately 20% is shared by the employee. And that's for active and retirees? That's active. Retirees, it's a slightly different mechanism, um, but it's along similar lines. There's a contribution by the city that's based upon past practice and precedent, and then there's contributions by the retirees that's based upon years of service when they retired, um, the type of program they're in, the coverage they've got, those sorts of items. Sure. Yes. Oh. Sorry, thanks. Well, uh, I'm, just so we're clear, that the premium is going up by 6%. Yes. And so the question is how much of that is coming out of the city pocket and how much are, are employee contributions well, increasing? Proposing we split our, our, we're not That's proposing that we change that split between employee city contribution for the different plans. And Jan can talk about it. So depending on which well, plan you're in, the city pays a portion, the city pays, or the right, employee okay. pays another portion, so. Great, so we'll, let, we'll allow you to explain okay. that to us. Thank, thank you. Thank you, I'll wait till the end, because I'm sure you'll <laughs> answer all my questions in your slide. Uh, the city's core medical program is our choice program. We also have a basic program and then a copay plan as well. The core program, uh, the core benefit program is an 80-20 plan, meaning that approximately 80% of the allowed charges are paid by the plan and approximately 20% would be the liability that the employee or the patient incurs. If um, an employee is in the, the choice plan, the range of increases um, for next year will range from approximately $8 a month increase to $33 a month increase. And that would depend upon which plan the employee is in um, and which tier of coverage, whether they've got employee only coverage or family coverage. So the $33 increase is a copay plan family coverage um, choice that would be happening. That would have a $33 increase in order for a person to continue in that plan. Most of our members are in the choice plan and the basic plan, and far fewer of them are in the copay plan, although we do still have a substantial number in the copay plan. Can this maybe high level, what's the difference between the choice and a copay plan? I think it may be helpful to know that. In terms of the benefit levels, yeah. the copay plan has a $250 deductible for a single person and a $750 deductible for the family, and then it pays essentially on in-network services 80% of the allowed charges and the member pays 20% of the allowed charges. The copay plan only has no deductibles and has copays in place for certain types of services. So your office visit type services, it could be a $20 or a $40 copay. Your emergency room services, it could be a $150 copay. Urgent care services, $50 copay. Inpatient um, hospitalization, it would be a $300 copay. And then outpatient services, it's a $200 copay. Other than that, that plan pays everything in network at 100% coverage. So it's a very rich, high value plan. And so certain individuals that have maybe concern about significant amount of health concerns that they may be needing that may be a plan but although it's a small what was the percentage you say that are in there it's um it, it's about a third of our yeah. po active population is in that plan so they choose to pay more coming out of their paycheck with the idea that because they may be going to utilize some medical more. issues yeah. they'll pay less out of pocket after that the, we also have our basic plan offering um, that is a plan that has a $500 deductible and a $1,500 family deductible. 
but the plan pays after that deductible's met at a 50% level, so it's a shared plan. The, the plan pays 50% and the employee would pay 50% um, of the allowed charges. So it's a, a, a much lower um, benefit level plan, but it does provide um, an essential, all the essential benefits that are provided for under um, the ACA. And it is very a very desirable plan to a lot of our employees and primarily because they pay no premium. The city does the total contribution for the premium for, the, for that plan. So it's very rich in that regard. We can see we've kind of given the bookend choices for employees to, to look at. It's kind of what we've tried to do. We will have some changes in our medical and vision plans next year, uh, but no changes in our dental benefit plans. And when I mean changes, I mean the change in the benefit levels uh, under certain circumstances. Specifically, because the um, out-of-network usage on the medical plan has been on the increase in those sorts of areas where there's a lot of utilisation or frequency, we've determined that we'd like to recommend cost containment strategies to incentivize that in-network op opportunity. So increasing the deductibles on out-of-network benefits. Currently, those deductibles are, are sitting at 1,000 and 3,000 for a family. <coughs> and those deductibles out-of-network are recommended to go to 1,500 for an individual and 4,500 for a family. So that means that the, the patient or the employee needs to spend that amount of money out of their own pocket before the plan will pay one cent relative to their next benefit level. So it is a significant increase, but it's heavily incentivizing people to stay in network or go in network wherever possible. And Jen, the reason is that, that we have negoti there are <coughs> negotiated fees for those who stay inside the network, correct? Correct. Correct. When you use the network environment, all the providers have negotiations with the network, it happens to be Cigna in, in our case, um, that they're going to accept a certain amount of total charge as being what they will accept in full for their services with no balance billing to the member. And that total charge is likely to be anywhere between 20 and 80 percent discount depending upon the particular provider that it is and the negotiated arrangements they have with the with the network. So there's a significant difference between that and being out of network where we have no opportunity for discounts uh, at all. We're sitting at full bill charges and having to reduce those to allowable levels uh, so that members then are also exposed to balance billing and they're also exposed to a much higher co-insurance amount that they need to do because that's the second choice uh, plan, plan design change I'd like to recommend, and that is that we go to the co-insurance on the out-of-network benefit levels being at a 50-50 basis instead of a 60-40 basis. So today, the plan's paying 60% of the allowed charges out-of-network. We're recommending that in 2020, the plan will only pay 50% and there's a 10% increase for those members that they've got the other 50% as well. Mr. Lona. Hey, Janet, do we have a lot of employees that are going out of network? Um, it, it depends on the service area. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we do have a, a significant number of claims in certain service areas. Tends to be those services that have a high frequency or repeated utilization. So a lot of the therapies, for example, mm -hmm chiropractic, physical therapy, sure. mm -hmm. mental health, behavioural mm -hmm. therapy, et cetera. Members tend to find a provider that they really like. If that provider is not in our network or anyone's network for that matter, um, they're loath to give them up mm -hmm. so long as they can pro find um, a middle road mm -hmm. The where they're getting the right sort of benefit level. So we want to provide extra encouragement that mm -hmm they really look at that mm -hmm. and make sure that they've done the math. Right, but we have a number of providers within network that oh, can yes. And that's the yes. key, right? Because yeah. if someone, if an employee chooses, stays inside of network, our cost for that same service is significant. Right. And we just, the idea that we're subsidizing someone who chooses to go outside of network for the same service, this is a way of kind of 
saying so you can do that, but you kind of need you need to pick up more of your fair share so that the whole system isn't covering that additional cost. And I think that's where we're trying. Yes, to Yes, uh, that's uh, that's entirely right, Mr. Brady. Um, the, the other thing to, to take a look at is that if you look at benchmark plan designs out there in the community and in the nation today, you will find that there are many plan designs who do not have any coverage for out-of-network services. It's strictly an in-network plan design. Now, I'm not recommending that we do that, but that would be a way that we could really incentivize uh, and encourage um, but it's not a benchmark that's across the board. It's just somewhat out there uh, for future consideration. But it does allow an employee who finds someone that they really, really like and they want it and they, as a chiropractic service or whatever, allows them to continue to go do that service. But we're trying to be careful so the rest of the employees who are getting that same service are not subsidizing it through the fees they have to pay. Yeah. Jeremy. Yeah, I just had a... That was part of my question, but what, how come you would recommend against uh, just outright canceling uh, the out-of-network stuff in order to contaminate the cost? It, it would, be, would be hugely dis disruptive to the patient base. It would involve major changes and probably create a significant um, unhappiness with all of the members in the plan. Okay. We're letting it be a choice of their economics is more what we're trying to do now. So it's, we've had those discussions. Yes. <laughs> Vision care programs is the other area that we have some significant and, and enhanced changes that are going on in the plan designs in 2020. We'll be adding a new vision plan alongside the current basic and vision plus plans that we have in place. The new vision plan will be a vision premium plus plan. And this is a plan that has five additional services that are available at either full coverage or a significant amount of coverage uh, that a person can choose from one of those enhanced options per year per person. Uh, it, it gives about a $400 extra value to the plan for any family membership that has more than two people in it, if indeed all of the family are using vision care services. So we've offered that in there uh, to provide those enhanced benefits with VSP, which is our vision uh, care plan provider. We've had vision uh, VSP in place for the last eight years. We're in the last year of our contract with them and uh, this was their offering to provide some enhancement or incentives for uh, members to be really satisfied with their plans, which they are in large part very much so. Um, the, the sorts of enhancements are on the frame allowances, the contact lens allowance, um, getting custom or progressive lenses fully covered, those sorts of things that would otherwise be out of pocket to the member uh, accordingly. We'll also have rate increases on this plan. Um, again, we haven't had any rate increases on the vision care plan in over four years. Uh, so the rate increases are modest, um, but they're there. Uh, it ranges from 10 cents a month to over $8 a month, depending upon which plan the member chooses and whether they have family coverage or only single coverage. All of this will be presented in our open enrolment period, which goes from October 23rd through November 6th with our uh, Health and Wellness Benefits Fair event at the Mason Convention Centre on October 29th from 9 till 2. Uh, th both of these um, pr uh, time periods and also the, the event are all about getting smarter about benefits and wellness. Uh, so we've got that theme heavily entrenched in all of the communications and all of the promotions that we'll be doing during that period. Bonus wellness points will be available to employees who attend the um, benefits fair and attend one of the seminars that will be available there to learn about the benefit programs and also uh, encouragement for them to visit each of the vendor booths that are health and wellness related, uh, get a stamp, interact, uh, receive some educational materials, ask questions, those, those types of activities, uh, and they'll be able to put that in for some extra bonus wellness points just before the deadline on those bonus wellness points for this year, which is October 31st. So, Jan, explain what bonus points allow, what, how does that 
Yeah. What is that? Why is the important to the employee? Yeah, it's important because that allows members to achieve points uh, to either be able to receive up, up to four $50 gift cards of $50 value gift cards um, from the wellness program and or to have up to a $200 um, discount available to them for use against their premiums that they might pay on the medical plan in 2020. So those are the core essences of our wellness program incentives. And it also, of course, includes usage of our health and wellness centre, uh, the Mesa Health and Wellness Centre as well. The Benefits Fair will have the usual other well-received events. Flu shots will be available, um, the food trucks, uh, the demonstrations, um, the employee network vendors will be there with all of their goodies. Um, there'll be handouts and uh, rewards available, um, contests to enter into, etc. cetera, uh, just like we've had before. Very well received and very well represented. Um, we usually expect to have anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 employees come through, uh, and retirees as well, come through that event on that day. So it's very well received uh, by city employees. And if you have any questions, I would be very willing to answer. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Luna. Uh, Jan, if council goes <coughs> and approves the changes, uh, when will employees see the, um, the effect of their their increase in, in health benefits? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, those increases will start in the first pay period in January. I think that's something like January 9th or 10th, somewhere in that e or area. Um, and the retirees will also see it in their billings that come through in the first part of January for January. Yep. They will see all the information um, commencing right around October 1st. We'll have everything start to post online and the benefits website in the open enrolment tool. And then during the open enrolment period itself on our uh, enrolment application, eBen Mesa, um, there will be all sorts of tools and information pieces that describe mm -hmm. all of this information. We will also have a guide out there on our employee benefits website that lists all of the um, price increases that are occurring and the, uh, the plan design changes mm -hmm. that are occurring as well. Is that uh, for 11 months or 12 months? Wasn't there a grace period one time, Mr. Brady, that we... Yeah. We're no, not, not this year. Not this year. <laughs> On the premium. We had a premium holiday. Premium. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's uh, no, no we, plan. We did, that's, yeah. We're not this year. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any other Jeremy. questions? Jeremy. Um, I think that uh, our current OPEB liabilities are roughly $200 million. How does this, how do these changes impact um, what we believe those long-term liabilities will be? Um, I don't have those specific numbers, but the, the, the analysis that we've done with our um, OMB partners, uh, has, has, has that has been part of why we've put the 3% increase in on the retiree program uh, in order to keep those liabilities in, in check. Okay. I mean, do we see the OPEB liabilities increasing drastically due to these changes? I mean, is it non-existent that we don't need to be worried about it? Um, can somebody from finance oh. answer that question? Uh, Mayor, Councilman Whitaker, let me think this through. So OPEB has to do with um, really um, our, our liabilities related to those who retired and our obligation to continue to provide them health benefits. So um, we, those retirees that are mm -hmm. eligible are sharing in the increase of this cost also. Um, so I'm trying to think this through. I don't know that, I know I'm looking for help here. Lifeline, Candace. Um, I don't know that this this by itself. I guess increasing costs of health insurance certainly pay, plays a role in that OPEB calculation. But as long as we're trying to address recovering costs for employees on the front end, I guess that helps a little bit, doesn't right. it? And Mayor and Council, and I'm hesitant to come up only because I'm hesitant to talk about OPEB, which is definitely an accounting um, term and goes into our CAFR and it was really not part of the consideration when we're looking at premiums and the ongoing sustainability of the program. So you would say when we're looking at this, um, when you're looking at OPEB, again, that is a liability. Um, Irma's, up here, Irma's here too. Just got but, a CPA up there. Um, <laughs> but whenever you look at this, the fact that you are decreasing the benefits for the out-of-network would in fact go into a future 
calculation would be my assumption on the OPEB because you are decreasing your liabilities in the future by taking that plan down. That would be Are any thoughts? Um, is this on? Okay. Um, when the actuaries look at the OPEB liability, they also look at other cost assumptions and whether those assumptions changed or, or not, and that can increase or decrease our liability. I just received the OPEB report for fiscal year 19 yesterday. I haven't reviewed it yet, um, but at quick glance, our liability did increase from the prior year. Okay. You don't recall. I mean, it was like it's roughly. It was change in assumption. So the the cost that um, the plan paid out in benefits did not change significantly at all okay. from the prior year. So what's driving the liability up is not what our costs are of the plan. It's really the changes in assumptions that the actuaries use. Like a, how long someone's going to live or something like that. Correct. Are we still using a seven point four percent actuarial? return on investment rate? Like I said, I just got the report yesterday. I haven't reviewed it, but I can I let you know. Yeah, I apologize. If you could just send that to me offline, that would be awesome. Or just let me know later. Yeah. Thanks. And we'll disclose it in the CAFR. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Thank you very much, ladies. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, next item on this agenda is the uh, appointment to the Museum and Cultural Advisory Board. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you. And second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Mr. Freeman, are you with us? I am. Aye. Okay, aye. So that, uh, that passed unanimously. Thank you. Next item is acknowledge receipt of board minutes. Is there a motion to that effect as well? Thank you, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Luna. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Th uh, Freeman. Any opposed? Uh, next is to hear reports uh, uh, on meetings and conferences attended. Hey, Council, anything you'd like to share with us? Mr. Luna. Uh, yes, uh, I want to thank uh, Detective Heyer and Lieutenant uh, Brian Seller from the Superstition uh, Station. Uh, did a ride along yesterday, got to see some of our homeless population in the area and how they do, what they do in order to move them from the location. And, and, and sort of the processing. And also had opportunity to visit our evidence uh, room over at the police station, which is quite interesting. Um, I also attended a ribbon cutting over at Akoya, a, a, a senior living facility in, in, uh, here in Mesa, District 5. And last night we had a real interesting presentation over at Shepherd Junior High. It was put on by Mesa Public Schools and it had to do with suicide awareness and, and it was a resource night over at Shepherd Elementary School. And it was true, uh, speak to parents um, related to the issue of, of teen suicide. So uh, great presentation. I'm glad that I was, uh, I was able to be part of that. Thank you. Is there an, a, a Mace Public Schools event today on yes. mental health? There is a resource fair this afternoon over at uh, their facility located on Brown and Country Club. Great. Mm -hmm. And is, that's for students and parents? Right. Yes. And that's at 1, 1 p.m., I think. You know, it's probably a sad but appropriate to note that we have had some high school suicides already this year. Uh, and We've had three, three in the last eight days. Yeah. So uh, this is a difficult issue to talk about, right. but it, it's terribly important that we do talk about right. it. So thank you for... for sure, and raising. a lot of the issues stem with uh, stress. A lot of kids <laughs> are, are stressed out. Uh, there's so many fa environmental factors that they're, that's affecting their lives. So yeah. it was a great session on how to how to work with your kids and how to deal with issues related to stress. Well, I know our, our school districts will be talking more about this, so just to, to raise awareness, if you're a parent or you you're, know a teenager, uh, it's important that you're at, always asking them how they're doing right. and that you do uh, take advantage of the resources that the school districts and the, the city will be making available on that. Thank you. Council, uh, Jen? Um, yes, I wanted to bring up a, a couple things that uh, I attended. First of all, I'll bring up the Mesa Arts Center season kickoff was Friday, and I remember seeing you, Mayor, mm -hmm. there as well. You were there as well, David. It was a fantastic event. Um, I strongly advocate to go see the um, new exhibit at the Contemporary Arts Museum. It's a free exhibit, day in and day out, and the event in itself, the um, performances, street, you know, the on-site 
which is free performances, it, a great turnout, very interactive. Commend the Mesa Art Center for doing a great job in involving our community in this great asset of the Art Center we have in downtown. Um, also, I um, attended a um, get-together with um, Nature's Cooling System, which is a part of a Nature's Conservancy. Um, study that we did on a neighborhood in downtown in Mesa as well as a couple of neighborhoods across the valley and looking how we can mitigate heat <coughs> in our neighborhoods um, through the community and also what we can do as a city and reducing the heat through shade and access walkways transportation and so that we can be a safer and community and as well as um, mitigate the heat that were that's occurring day in and day out um, throughout the years. Um, and then uh, this, this evening I'll be attending a Visit Mesa networking event, but why I wanted to bring that up is because I wore my uh, Visit Mesa pin today is the autism certification that Visit Mesa has taken on, as well as our Parks and Recreation Department which is the largest, I think, city organization or park, uh, definitely, I think it's the first parks, um, parks and Recreation Department has gone through this uh, training so that we recognize the um, autism and the needs and the awareness to be a more embracing um, and friendlier community because autism affects most everybody's life. Um, we all have it in our families and friends. And in fact, um, I heard this morning on the news that um, an autistic child w that was blind won a talent contest in America's yeah, because yeah, of yeah. the voice and stuff like that. So they're um, having autistic individuals. That's a really good Certainly. video if you ever look it up online. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. But I haven't really, seen it. I just heard about video. it this morning. Yeah, you should Google so it. So I was just thrilled to see you know the great talents that are from our autistic community and what they contribute to our, our community. Um, and tomorrow is um, Bike Mesa in downtown Mesa, excuse me, is a national, international parking day. Bike Mesa is uh, supporting that as well as Rayal Mesa. So we're taking up a couple of parking spaces on the northwest corner of Robeson and Main, turning, turning it into a parklet, and we'll have a demonstration of um, uh, bike parking in those spaces and a community area, and that'll happen from midday on um, tomorrow until about dusk. So I'll stop in and see how we can use uh, our parking spaces a little bit differently and, and uh, be part of the community. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you. And yeah, real quick, uh, just a shout out to uh, city staff and the folks that are organizing the Love Your City service projects across the city. Uh, I know we had one in District 3 this past Saturday, and there's various different ones uh, across the, the city uh, in the next several weeks. So I want to give uh, Eagle Scout group that helped this Saturday in, along uh, some of the, clear out some of the alleys uh, near Adams Elementary, uh, some of the neighborhood brush. So uh, thank you uh, for the city staff that are working on, on those projects and coordinating volunteers. There's about... There's like 25 volunteer Eagle Scouts and others uh, on, on Saturday. So thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Freeman, anything you'd like to share with us? Not at this point. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll note that uh, Mr. Thompson and I had the opportunity to go to uh, Cupertino uh, for a day trip uh, a couple of days ago to uh, check in with the folks at Apple and to get an update on the um, the operation, the data center in Mesa. It was global infrastructure. It, it, it is a worldwide headquarters of their data center operations, and it was a great visit. Uh, Apple obviously very... Uh, uh, appreciative of their relationship with Mesa and uh, the other thing we talked about is the way that they're interacting in, in our community uh, they are very they are a their corporate philosophy is not to uh, get a lot of publicity for the good works they do in the in our community so uh, it sometimes the general public might not be aware of all the great things that Apple is doing uh, like the contributions they're making and uh, with, with between volunteers and, and actually donating 
uh, products and other things, but they are a great community partner and appreciated the chance to go and, and uh, talk with uh, some of the executives at, at Apple this week. Uh, also, earlier this week, the Mesa Historical Museum out at, in Lehigh on Horn uh, opened a, a new exhibit that, that's extremely good. I would encourage uh, folks, if they're looking for something to do in Mesa and are interested in, in Mesa history, or, or actually the, the exhibit ha is about quilting, uh, uh, among other things. But there, it's uh, separate from that exhibit, the, the, muse the standalone museum is, is very interesting as well. So I encourage you to, to go take a look at that. Anything else? Mr. Thompson. Just a reminder, we have a naturalization ceremony at 10 o'clock at Skyline High School this morning. Yes, so I, I think several of us are planning on going to that, so we probably ought to move this meeting along. Is there uh, a uh, Mr. Brady? What is our schedule? Just a reminder, we do have a state session council meeting on Monday, September 23rd. And also, as you go down to the Contemporary Art Museum, there are there is a city employee who works for the Mace Art Center, who, cur who is curating uh, at least two pieces? Two pieces. Two pieces, and, and um, Frank, Gonzalez. Frank Gonzalez. So that's kind of unique to have a city employee who's got some uh, work down in the contemporary art. So it's right. pretty cool. Yeah. Was he the one that did the garbage <coughs> truck? Or am I mixing? No, it's, the, it's okay. the big round one with yeah. Friday. Sorry, that's yeah. completely irrelevant. No, it's, There's another city employee that made a complete child's children's book about the garbage truck and my son loves it it's like one oh of his no no books. yeah that we have that that, yeah. that we yes th that is a city employee on the recite yes i think I we, just, that's our city that wasn't our city employee did some of that maybe in solid, in solid ways yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but actually in the museum it's, we have yeah sure. thank you so Sorry. to your point it's probably good to remind people that the contemporary arts gallery just opened a new exhibit as well so yeah. that, that was part of yeah. the opening that jen described earlier so if you haven't again the that art museum is free to the public. Yeah. So uh, please, uh, there's some great uh, art exhibits right now in the uh, amazing pinatas. The pinatas are amazing. Pina they are the amazing. medieval pinatas. Yeah. Pinatas. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't bring your back. Don't bring your back. All right. We uh, sounds like we're done, but we're not done. Is there a motion to convene an executive session? Thank you, Mr. Thompson, and seconded by Jen. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We will aye. commence. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. We will commence an executive session.